Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so welcome back for this second session of today. And uh, this session is again going to be a 45 minute uh, long and followed by a 15 minute slot specifically meant for a discussion session. Uh, for this second session of day five, we have with us uh, Ms. Mahak Vajpayee. She's a research scholar at the National Law University, Delhi. Ma'am is an honorary researcher for the Committee on Reforms in Criminal Laws. She has also worked on the NHRC's project with NU Delhi on the post -share. And she has also taken up teaching assistant assignments in the university for the LLM course. She has contributed to several journals as a contributor and editor. She also continues to write for mainstream newspapers on several issues. Her doctoral research is on the positive obligation and study of omissions in criminal law in India, which is inspired by Professor Ashford's work on the same. Ma'am's today's lecture topic, that is positive obligations in criminal law, exploring Ashford's thesis is also inspired by the same. So uh, with this ma'am, over to you, without wasting any further time, I request you to uh, address all of us. Um, hi, uh, thank you for that introduction and uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, me for this talk on positive obligations in criminal law. And uh, so, I mean, before I begin, I'd like to tell you that I'm uh, not going to speak for 45 minutes, <laughs> mainly because I think if you're, you know, hearing about positive obligations in criminal law for the first time, all you need to do is just familiarize yourselves with this issue on a basic level because it's ultimately Professor Ashworth's thesis and then just think about it and have a discussion on it, right? So uh, if you've gone through the book that was provided to you, you must have seen that it is Professor Ashworth who's used this phrase, positive obligations in criminal law, you'll not find this anywhere else. He's a pioneer in this field. Um, and this phrase, positive obligations, is uh, generally used in the context of human rights. And uh, Professor Ashworth has a piece on that aspect of obligations as well. Right? So uh, we know that positive obligations are where you have a certain duty to perform and negative obligations are where you're prohibited to act in a certain way, right? This, uh, we all know it's jurisprudence 101. And our criminal law is largely based on the latter, right? That is negative obligations. Uh, however, please, uh, you know, also note that positive obligations in human rights are largely imposed on the state. You know, there, there they talk about um, how state has certain obligations towards its citizens. Active duties the state is supposed to perform in order to, uh, uh, to, to uh, further protection of their citizens, the, the concept of welfare state, right? Interestingly, Professor Ashworth, of course, if you've grazed through the book uh, we've provided on uh, provided you on positive obligations, uh, he talks about the state's positive obligations as well as citizens' obligations towards each other as well and towards the state. So, you know, we've been uh, hearing this since the beginning of this program that criminal law should not be repressive, it should not be punitive. We've been talking about law and emotions, we've been talking about the restorative ethos of criminal law, uh, forgiveness, right? So let, now let's talk about a positive criminal law because it is in that sense this, this topic becomes relevant for a critical uh, criminal law student, right? So, uh, you know, so many of you must have heard Michael Sandel's lectures, right? He gives this very um, this interesting scenario to his students where but there's a train coming towards a man standing on one of the tracks. And then there are five other people walking on a different track, right? And the train can be diverted to save either this one man and kill the other five or vice versa. And then he poses certain questions about morality and law and ethics. Who are, we, how, who are you going to save, right? And similarly, if you read Ashworth, I don't know if you, how much time you got, you know, because it's a big book. If you read Ashworth, especially this chapter on uh, criminalizing omissions, he poses a similar question on blameworthiness. He asks that, you know, in a situation, for example, uh, where you actively throw somebody who you know cannot swim into a pool, knowing that this person is going to drown and die. And another situation where you're a bystander who can, you know, uh, 
the, save a drowning man because you know how to swim, but you just walk right past him. You know, you don't take any active steps to save him. So he asks whether this omission to save someone is less blameworthy than actually throwing someone into the pool because ultimately a person is dying, right? The outcome is the same. And he says, yes, that is our current, uh, current understanding of criminal law. We uh, tend to react differently to killers than to non-savers. But he says that, you know, uh, both acts are probably equally morally blameworthy. So these are the issues we're trying to explore in this presentation, right? Uh, so what does Professor Ashworth's thesis mean for this relationship between criminal law, individual liberty, and positive obligations? Whether his thesis is justified in terms of its implications on individual liberty, because and, and also because criminal law is not restricted to incarceration as a form of punishment. So whether it is, uh, you know, possible to explore other forms of responses that are uh, better suited to enforce positive obligations. And uh, also, please bear in mind, this topic is very important to students of critical criminal law because here in this, Ashworth is critiquing our foundations, our current understanding of criminal law, right? He is challenging the foundations of liberal theory, you know, that puts individual liberty at a pedestal. It considers omissions less blameworthy than acts. It considers that, you know, the idea that there is a clear demarcation between legal, moral, and social obligations. Uh, in this presentation, we are reading positive obligations in criminal law through omissions. Uh, we're all aware that criminal law punishes both acts and omissions, right? Actus reus includes acts as well as omissions. So he says, you know, in order to enforce positive obligations on people, you have to criminalize omissions because Omissions mean that law has imposed a certain duty on you and you fail to carry out that duty. And hence, criminal sanction is attracted, right? This is what an omission is. However, interestingly, omissions have never been on the fore of the discourse on criminal law anywhere. That is why Andrew Ashworth becomes a very important scholar in this regard, because I'm sure I won't be able to do justice to his, this entire body of work on positive obligations, because he's talking about so many things here and there's it's, it's a very nuanced debate right so uh, the starting point for ashworth is that it makes sense to speak of omissions only when there is uh, when there is a duty to act and then he lays down set of three very important principles and these uh, these are firstly the principle of urgency Right, so he says that uh, the case for recognizing a positive duty to act is at its strongest when there are situations of urgency or emergency. Right, uh, so on rare occasion when action needs to be taken immediately in order to preserve something of fundamental value, there is a clear argument for departing from the normal legal ordering in favor of individual autonomy and imposing a duty on persons present. So, right. So, for example, um, what could be some examples uh, where, for example, when there, when there is an imminent threat to a person's life, then probably it is justified uh, that the person should, you know, cooperate with the law enforcement and um, act to save this other person. Right. This is the principle of urgency. He says this is probably one situation where uh, you can expect people to um, help others. Secondly, he talks about the priority of life. Um, he says that survival of each individual is of utmost value. So this principle, along with the principle of urgency, po poses a very strong argument for recognizing a duty to act. You know, he goes on to explain that, 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 uh, that this duty should lie with the state in the first place. But the when, you know, emergency services fail to help, unless they are alerted. And there may be situations in which is, it is reasonable to expect an individual to do more than simply alert the authorities. Uh, and you know why, the, whenever I read this principle, I wonder whether a person is supposed to risk her own life in order to save the other, right? And can criminal law actually impose that sort of obligation on anyone? 
it, it, because look at right to self de uh, defense in IPC, it gives you a certain immunity if you act in order to save another's life, right? The law and right to defense allows you to protect another person or their property and what have you, but it does not force you to do that, right? So, of course, what he's saying is very important because, well, imminent threat to life might require a bystander to act. However, I mean, he does answer this later in the chapter that the person who is expected to help or save another cannot be expected to risk his own life to do that, right? And he discusses this the next uh, principle, which is the principle of opportunity and capacity, right? So he says that wherever these principles apply, uh, the principle of urgency and the priority uh, to life, the duty to act should fall on the person who has the opportunity and capacity, both physical and psychological, to render some assistance. He says that firstly, you have to be physically present at the scene, right? It is a precondition to impose any positive duty on anyone. He also lays down certain exceptions, like, you know, duty of parents to protect their child, irrespective of the fact they were physically present at the scene or not. Or a duty of lifeguard uh, to be present near the swimming pools to make sure nobody drowns. And, you know, there are some scenarios, he says, where not being physically present cannot be an excuse. So, so, so throughout this discussion on positive obligations in criminal law, it is absolutely important to remember these three principles because, well, Ashworth is fundamentally against unprincipled criminalization, right? If you read the first, very first chapter is uh, the criminal law lost cause. Uh, he talks about how criminalization is largely unprincipled. He is talking in the uh, context of England. But well, it stands true for every uh, every place. So now uh, we come on to certain general duties that Ashworth describes that are enforceable under the English criminal law, as well as you know generally recognized most widely across legal systems as a basis for criminal conviction. Please note that a duty to rescue, the duty that we are talking about here, like duty to save someone has not been mentioned anywhere because uh, in, in the, the list he gives, because this offense is not recognized in common law jurisdictions, okay? It is it is recognized in a pretty uh, a good number of civil law countries, but, uh, but, you know, however, his larger question is not whether duty to rescue should exist, but whether there are any grounds for imposing criminal sanction on those who fail to carry out such duties, right? Now, um, I'll take you through certain duties that the criminal law imposes across most common law jurisdictions. Uh, if you have the book with you, the soft copy, you can refer to page, I think, 43 for this. Or not, it's up to you because, uh, yeah, the first is family obligations, right? Uh, he says that the first source of obligations may be found in the family. For example, um, duty of parents to provide the necessities of life for their children. So, I mean, think about on somewhat same lines, you can think of section 125 of CRPC, uh, which is order, order for maintenance of wives, children, and parents. So, it is not that positive obligations is an unknown terrain for criminal law in India as well, right? Uh, then he talks about duty of members of a household to protect children and vulnerable adults in the household from violence from other members of the household. This is also one of the... Uh, uh, family obligations. Next, we come to obligations incurred voluntarily. See, so these are certain obligations where a person chooses to enter. It's like if you choose to do X, then you must bear certain positive obligations. Uh, for example, you know, think of any financial or business activities, the ownership and driving of a motor vehicle, right? Section 5 of the Motor Vehicle Act, which puts responsibility on the owner to ensure that she has a driving license and that she's of appropriate age. Now, you know, think about the fact that you have to pass a driving test before you can obtain a license. This example is very important because if you don't know how to drive, you become a threat to people on the road, right? So where there is a risk to life, imposing positive obligations is generally justified, right? Uh, then uh, in this, you also have duty of person, uh, persons in possession of hazardous materials. Like if you're if you own explosives, ammunition, etc., you have the duty to protect people from dangerous effects of those materials, right? Then you have duty of persons working in financial sector 
to disclose certain information to the government, right? Like dealing with large amounts of money that may be uh, that may have been laundered, or from a contracting party to disclose information to the other party to the transaction, which are insurance contracts. Then in in the similar obligations incurred voluntarily, you have duty of persons um, having contractual duties or voluntary undertaking of care for one or more others or having the lawful custody of one or more others to ensure the health and welfare of those individuals, right? And then he comes on to the third category, which is um, obligations arising from causal responsibility. This is very interesting because we now turn to a type of situation that is explicitly non-chosen, you know, when a, where a person accidentally creates a danger. The case of R versus Miller 1983, I don't know if you remember, you know, where a person fell asleep while smoking and unintentionally set fire to the bed. So, I mean, so the argument is that the person who created the accident, since he is causally responsible for it, he ought to bear the duty to take action to minimize further harm, you know, like by calling for help or, you know, trying to do something to diffuse the situation within capacity without incurring personal danger. So it's very important because we also, throughout this discussion, we have to, Keep in mind those three principles, the principles of the principle of urgency, the principle of the priority to life and the principle of opportunity and capacity. Uh, you know, where, wherever a person is causally responsible for an accident, he has a duty to pay damages, right? That is, uh, that is a very known duty. B, then he talks about civic obligations. He says, Professor Ash Ashworth says that this is probably the most debatable of the four categories of obligation because you know he says that we know that it is the state's duty to provide emergency support to its citizens but is it also the citizens responsibility to be you know cooperative citizens however you know this this uh, is just slightly problematic in a regard that this leaves this unresolved question whether citizens should be expected to participate in law enforcement and the failure to do so should attract criminal liability, right? Because uh, we understand that the, because wherever there's a criminal sanction involved, the stakes on individual liberty are quite high, right? So uh, this is because in civic obligations, um, well, it can be a person's moral responsibility, but can it be also uh, a responsibility backed by criminal law? That is a question uh, that needs to be resolved. Right, uh, think about duty to assist in law enforcement, right, uh, of a police officer to intervene to prevent a crime, like, or of a citizen to assist in law enforcement when called upon to do so. Do so. Uh, I, I don't remember the section, is it one? Uh, you have this duty to assist in law enforcement in IPC as well. I am forgetting the section. Uh, so, I mean, these are pretty much recognized duties. You, you are under obligation to assist law enforcement at all times. Right, then duty of all persons to notify police about suspected terrorist offenses committed by another. Okay, leave aside terrorist offenses, that is, of course, your duty. And think about um, um, POXO, where you have a uh, duty to report sexual abuse against children. Right, it is a very well recognized duty that is a positive obligation imposed by criminal law on citizens. Then duty of persons and professionals to notify to the authorities, about, like I said, suspected child abuse. Um, then you also have duty to treat victims by the hospitals that also you have an IPC, right? So, uh, this is, um, a broad, a very, actually, this is, I, I as I said, I won't be able to just do justice to this topic, uh, because, um, but, but I tried my best to take you through some principles and the certain kinds of duty, he, duty situations he's talking about. And, and as, as uh, students of critical criminal law, this, as I said, posed uh, a lot of questions about uh, the stakes this has on, uh, on individual liberty and, you know, the, the relationship between criminal law, individual liberty and positive obligations. And it makes you wonder whether all this is justified in terms of its implications on individual liberty. And, uh, this, this, therefore, I think this topic becomes very important uh, for for us, and um, of course, uh, this involves. If you if you read the book, he also talks about ignorance of law, 
right this is a very known maximum ignorance of law is no excuse but uh, he you know he also says that well when state says that ignorance of law is no excuse it's essentially saying that it's not my responsibility to tell you the law the, sh the state is shrugging off its responsibility i mean that's that's one perspective but uh, i mean he's posing these questions on similar lines so i think it's it's a great body of work and uh, if you get the time please do read uh, especially this chapter on criminalizing omissions it, it definitely makes you uh, think so i mean that's all i have from my side um if you have any questions or any thoughts or uh, any reservations please free, feel free to uh, let me know yes ma'am uh, thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for addressing all of us so the floor is open for a discussion uh, if uh, anybody wants to discuss or have any comments or questions please uh, raise your hand Okay, so Nandini ma'am has posted some comments in the chat box. Uh, ma'am, uh, Nandini ma'am, would you like to uh, speak? Ma'am, uh, uh, it was very nice. I think this session should have been in the beginning of the uh, uh, program because it throws light right. on how omission has been. Basically, we always talk about actus reus, not highlighting about omissions. But that has been very well laid down in both common law principles as well as uh, to a large extent in most of the civil law systems also and in the Indian Penal Code. Right. But how do we critique this, ma'am? That is what I was not able to uh, uh, understand that as it is well laid principle, how do we critique this under the critical legal studies? Uh, right. So, so that's what I to uh, said, right? Um... Because our system is based on liberal ethos, the liberal theory, right? The individual liberties of paramount importance. So, so when you, you're talking about positive obligations, when you're talking about criminalizing omissions, you're challenging those ethos, right? So this is a very uncomfortable pro uh, proposition to a criminal law student. It, it is a critique. You're, you're questioning the foundations. You're, um, you're saying essentially that there are certain situations where individual liberty is not that important. What is important that citizens um, assist in law enforcement. The crime, the role of crime prevention is also on the citizens. It is on the state, but the citizens also have a role to play in that. Uh, I don't think uh, besides Professor Ashworth, anybody has thought of this. So he is essentially critiquing the foundations. He's done this. That is what he's done is the critique of um, of the foundations of criminal law through this body of work. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Kalpana, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. there would be a lot of problem since uh, yeah definitely something is already existing for long and uh, challenging that uh, foundation is always prob problematic so it would uh, suppose uh, do you personally advocate criminalization of omissions in criminal well, I'm um, not that I'm not that far into my research yet <laughs> to um, uh, critique Professor Ashworth, but that's what I'm trying to do in my uh, thesis as well. You know, you're absolutely right. It has uh, far reaching implications. The reason it is uncomfortable as for us to imagine because we've never thought of criminal law like this. Uh, but I think um, uh, so if you don't have incarceration as a form of punishment, then if you ask me personally, I think uh, you can put community service for defaulters. You don't have to put them in jail just because they fail to save someone, right? Maybe, uh, 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 just community about... service is also uh, any any form of sensitization. It does not have to be punitive, essentially, right? You So the question of liability and the question of punishment are two separate things. Is on. I... 
Right. Am I audible? Uh, making a choice about uh, something, uh, I think uh, uh, a liberty should uh, remain with person, can you know, it. So, I mean, we are not supposed to take his thesis as it is. I mean, we can make it suitable for uh, Indian situations. We we have a glaring problem of enforceability in India. Yeah, it's very uh, difficult to enforce uh, things. The setup of law, it is too meager to address the issues, actually. We, abhi data aya tha jisme takriban, uh, more than four crores of the cases are pending in Indian courts. Right, right. So seeing that situation, if we bring the criminalization of omissions into criminal jurisprudence would be a difficult situation altogether. Right, right, right. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. And that is uh, people who've written responses to Professor Ashworth have raised a similar uh, problem with his thesis that, you know, everybody would, you'll find everybody in the court for just being, you know, unable to save someone. Or omitting so, someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the question he's posing, like, but, well, are omissions yeah. less blameworthy than acts? Ma'am, if I can add, ma'am, if I can add, if you permit, Mahek, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The, the purpose of telling that omissions to be held liable is only when you took a voluntary legal obligation in the example you gave. Where, hmm. for example, you gave the swimming pool example, if somebody is drowning, I don't have a duty, even if I know swimming. But mm -hmm. if I am a trainer in the swimming pool, I mm -hmm. owe a duty at that particular term, my omission will be criminally liable, not otherwise. So he's right. very clear when he writes it. Mm -hmm. right, right. That is what is written. It is not that valid unless and until I have a liability towards somebody. For example, even if I have to take care of my parents, mm -hmm. because they are my parents, I am legally obliged to take care. If any other old man or an old woman is there, I have no obligation. But if I volunteer to take an obligation and if something happens to them, only then I'm going to be liable. So right, that legal right. obligation is already given. That leads to omission and criminal liability as per my understanding of as well. Yeah, yeah. It right. is Thank, you. Thank you. It is expressly <clears throat> provided in many of the sections. Omit to do something would invite uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So that's what he, but then he's asking then, uh, can we move beyond this? Can we yeah. talk about duty to rescue? It's like so it exists in civil law jurisdictions. That is a question he's posing. Um, this exists, we know. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, ma'am, this is Maris Port here, ma'am. May I come in, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. uh, ma'am, actually, uh, especially I would like to take uh, uh, you to other uh, criminal laws. Uh, you take yeah. the right to education bill. Okay, if, when we talking right. about some similar countries like German, if you are not sending the child, you will be given imprisonment as a punishment, right? Similarly, if you see that we have such provision, such omission into law, and we actually impose a similar provision, uh, a kind of imprisonment under I, uh, RTE, right? Right. So, right. Uh, similarly, post Nirbhaya, if you see. Obligation mm. actually interested to the medical practitioners, mm. especially who is supposed to treat. Uh, and and th there are some provisions here and there, the even CRPC, if you look at that, it is the duty of the citizen to assist, but there is no punishment. But actually, I feel, ma'am, there is some kind of, you can say, the threshold from the Ashworth, we have to take it. So, wherever possible, we have to uh, back up with some kind of, uh, you can say that legal sanction in the form of criminalization, then only that positive application can be enforced. Otherwise, in the form of administrative regulations or other ways, I feel that it is not possible. Of course, if we go beyond uh, which is worth asking, that's where the RTE come into picture, which I feel. Similarly, the obligation to the medical practitioners, which we have interested now, right? Otherwise, they are not, they have the choice to treat, right? It is not their obligation to everyone. If anybody pays, right, so right, so. so this is this is I would like to uh, give my view, ma'am. And in fact, um, as what we if you go and beyond, uh, if you take some of the regulations with regard to swimming pool and other things, especially if you look at the uh, positive obligation, especially omissions, uh, some of them coming under morality, or you can say that uh, 
some principles of you can say that religious obligation but other than that if we see that uh, how it has been incorporated even come into picture especially civil law i feel that rte and the medical practitioners which we have to uh, taken into account how that asworth uh, thoughts actually become reality this is uh, my view again i may be subjected to uh, criticism i am welcome for that but this is i would like to highlight ma'am especially how right, right. we have gone beyond what asworth asked Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your views and I absolutely agree with you. The examples you gave were very pertinent and uh, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Interpreet Kaur. Uh, thank you uh, for giving us such a wonderful lecture on this topic because this topic is uh, very much important for us because everyone is focusing on the definition that act or omission is which is forbidden by law is a crime. But everyone is focusing only one part that is act, but everyone is not uh, talking about much on the omissions, which is not counted by the other, others. And the uh, uh, the point you have raised that the duty to rescue, uh, I think it is mentioned in the torts, voluntary non-fit injury as the exceptions, the rescue cases. Right, right. I think, uh, no, that absolutely, I, that's that's absolutely right. I think um, Ashworth's idea is to bring it in the purview of criminal law so that, well, there's a punishment, so you create deterrence. So people actually do uh, what you require them to do. Right, right. I think yeah. Everyone is focusing to do, not to do, not to do, but they are not focusing. <laughs> right. Not to... right, right. Absolutely. Ma problem. Because they are talking about the legal obligations, as the Nandini ma'am said, that the legal obligation only, because we have no number of morals that is up to us that we have to follow or not follow. But being a parent, being a guardian, being a husband and uh, the other where you have a legal duty, you have to go by that. But otherwise you are not. But it is a moral duty. Right, right ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you. Arshida ma'am. Uh, thank you ma'am for uh, such insightful session. So my uh, question or a, or like a really different thought about is that if we are looking forward to making the legal sanctions or some uh, or some actions towards who uh, towards people against some people who have not complied with the duty. So my thought is what if we have some incentives, what sort of incentives that we can have that can boost or encourage people to comply with the duty, you know, that could establish uh, in the society that uh, major uh, values that we have that the duty to rescue that the duty to report some possible cases so we can have some incentives also like major like uh, you know in place of punishments like uh, as you have said that in place of placing them into jails we can have into the community service so what if we have those uh, incentives like some of those finance like what drives people into inculcate those positive behaviors, positive duties? So what, like some incentives like social recognition like drives people. The financial security also drives people. So what is your thought about it? That no, we can really implement. No, that, that's a wonderful thought. And um, I don't know if you're aware, I think in 26, 2016, um, the Supreme Court came up with Good Samaritan guidelines. Where if you yeah. as a bystander, if you uh, if you actually rescue a victim of accident, you get some sort yeah, of yeah. reward, right? And yeah. at most, you're yeah. not penalized, right? Exactly. Uh, so so yeah. uh, no, that's a very that's a great thought. Incentivizing um, this um, definitely, I I agree with you, and that's why I said um, well, we we are afraid of doing this because all we we realize that the implications of imposing criminal sanction is ultimately sending people to jail. So if we yeah. take that out of equation, maybe this becomes a more comfortable uh, choice for us. You're absolutely right. I agree with yeah. you. When we have the resources to incline towards the, you know, punishing people, we can have those resources useful for the community service to encourage those behaviors. So that's my point. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Achinti Arora. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I was just wondering that maybe one way of critiquing uh, what Ashworth has suggested on positive obligations 
can be the way uh, uh, at least in our jurisdictions uh, uh, in, in our national context if i was to talk about uh, the power dynamics would play a very key role uh, because for all practical purposes let's say if i am to come from a, 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 a come from a feminist perspective uh, and if i was to talk about let's say domestic violence or uh, demand of dowry for example then um, even though there may be positive obligations on the woman herself or her family members to report such a crime but uh, for all practical reasons they would be hesitant in doing so uh, right and uh, Again, that is something which is not there for the lack of incentive or anything like that, but uh, rather that is the way their uh, relationship with people in power, uh, uh, both in official capacities as well as their own personal relationship works out. Uh, so I think uh, that is something very important that can be kept in mind while we are discussing uh, this work on positive obligations. So these are just my two cents, ma'am. Obviously, you would know better. Yeah, no, 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 you're you. absolutely right, uh, Chintya. And in fact, uh, so my thesis is on this issue. My thesis is on positive obligations, um, exploring this idea in, in sexual offenses. So because why? Just think about a situation where this thought of helping somebody would probably be more comfortable to you if the person involved belongs to a vulnerable section of the society. Right. So if, if you see a sexual offense, um, you see that the person belongs to a vulnerable section of society, you would want to help that person. Maybe not everyone, but are the dynamics different for sexual offenses? You're, you're absolutely right. You raised a very pertinent point. I mean, you talked about the practical aspect of it as well, and that, that the people may not actually want to report. Uh, that is also a perspective that has to be kept in mind. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and in in fact, ma'am, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm continuing this. Uh, that's okay. That's uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but one uh, uh, very important point is that actually abiding by such positive obligation can lead to some kind of an harm or detriment to myself. Uh, mm. You know, let's say uh, even if uh, like you are researching in the area of sexual offenses, but let's say even otherwise, if I am to talk about. Uh, let's say a crime committed by uh, a, a local Bahubali or a local mafia don in my area. And uh, I am, for all theoretical reasons, I may be under an obligation to report it. But what kind of repercussions would follow if I actually go ahead and do it? Right. And right. that is something that we see in a lot of uh, 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 web series and mm -hmm. movies and everything. That may be true as well. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, that is uh, one way of looking at it. Right, right, absolutely. And I think Ashwat talks about this, like this should be done without uh, putting him, the person should not be put in a position to put himself into a dangerous situation. Of course, but uh, it depends on the situation and circumstances. Uh, no, you're absolutely right, yes. Nidhi, Nidhi ma'am. Thank you, Amit, and uh, thank you, Ms. Mehak, for br uh, bringing this uh, issue up. Uh, I have certain reflections. So when you were talking about the principle of prioritizing human life, uh, I'm reminded of a case, R versus Doodley, where five people were stranded in high seas and they had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and then they all decided to kill the weakest among them and they killed the boy uh, who was around 16 17 years and then they fed on his flesh and blood and when this case finally uh, went to the court the court says so uh, they argued that uh, like self preservation is also uh, one of the basic instinct as well as duty so you have a duty for yourself also you are required to preserve yourself but the court said that sacrifice is a is of bigger value so uh, in this situation, like they, they knew that they won't get any help for other four or five days. And the boy was anyways, the boy was in that condition that he would die anyway. So the best uh, they could decide was to kill the weakest among them. And then they have to like uh, uh, preserve themselves. So the court also uh, brought this notion of sacrifice and sacrifice as a bigger duty or of bigger value uh, than to preserve yourself. So is Ashworth uh, 
also saying something on this line or uh, like does he have any uh, reflection on uh, like on duty to yourself right like as i said i think he he clearly says that there should not be any explicit harm to yourself in any way he does talk about that but um, i think when he's talking about prioritizing human life he's trying to say that um, you know in some situations where um, you see um, i don't know i don't i can't think of an appropriate example but there's do you see a situation where the person is not under imminent threat to life okay the person is being teased for example or bullied i don't know maybe some situation where you can clearly assess that the person is not under uh, you know danger to his life or limb so in that situation he's saying if you don't uh, rescue that person if you fail to save alert the authorities it's all right but when situation demands uh, there is a threat to life there's threat to uh, threat to his uh, his his personhood then it is justified that you can expect a bystander uh, to act in that situation that's what he is trying to say i think that's his point i, I don't think he talks about self preservation or anything on these lines i am not sure but so no you raised a very important point yeah i think these values or these points also should be taken care of when we talk about positive obligations like uh, specific right. yeah this i'm sorry so specifically if we talk about such circumstance do you think in such circumstance positive obligation should also take care of positive obligation towards yourself jai <laughs> <laughs> that's such a very fascinating question positive obligation towards oneself but he does not talk about it and i think r versus dudley right it was more about um, so if your motive is right that's what the point was right if um, morally i was right the person's going to die so let me eat this person so that at least i survive so very utilitarian uh, sort of uh, idea so he, he does not talk about that but i think in that case the, the thing was ki agar motive theek hai to kya killing justified hai the court said no right that was the case i don't think he is uh, advocating that in any way Uh, sorry to please my take away sorry to interrupt between dr kishan yes, side maybe i would uh, ask you to go through the judgment portion in r versus dudley and stephens where just said about why did he reject the idea of self preservation at the cost of the life of the weakest here he focuses the morality on the part your life uh, austin talks about self regarding duties and etc you do have but again not at the cost of the life of the weakest morality does not allow it you see the situation of yourself stepping into the shoes and uh, you know so uh, you should uh, go through that judgment why the defense of self preservation was rejected by house of lords Hello. Change. I am telling you. <laughs> Sometimes morality works more than law, you know. Because history is full of sacrifices. When it comes to save the life, then we choose the life of other, not ours, and particularly not at the cost of others' life. Killing by someone, you can choose to save your life, but not by killing someone. And particularly, who is the weakest? so i think uh, you should go uh, through that judgment and it would change your uh, thinking process sure ma'am thank you thank you for the insight hello actually i want to share something on it that actually we are living in nowadays we are living in a welfare state so we can't focus on only myself because uh, you have to think about the others also and in uh, if you read the ipc there is a term as a private defense rather than a self defense because we have to focus on the others also because we have to uh, leave the morals if we are teaching the students as a uh, value education and the, these are morals so we can't uh, go by that i think so 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for your use. Absolutely. Ankur Madhya has posted some comment in the chat box. Uh, Ankur, can you please uh, unmute yourself and speak? Yes, sir. So it was regarding that uh, example ma'am gave. So there is an exception in um, IPC, that is section 81, which says that uh, if you don't have any intention or uh, you are you're not at fault or negligence is not there. So you, in a situation where, like to save the life of uh, 100, you can kill one. So similar is uh, with the exception given in IPC and also if you talk about fire brigades and all, so they also have this uh, liberty that to save people so they can uh, override some laws as in speed they can uh, exceed the speed which is their speed limit which is there or saving um, a human life you can kill a kill an animal so something like that so you have to see that what is more important in that particular circumstance so you can override so it is said that uh, procedure is there but you can always override the procedure justice has to be done so justice is what is required thank you thank you so thank you so much uh, so we have time left for this session if there is any other observation command and questions participants can come forward uh, i want to share that there is a one law on the whistleblower is also there in the country that who are uh, um, giving such type of information then that will be the secrets on this point right right and i think it goes well with this um i think somebody talked about incentivizing uh, positive obligations right so you basically whistle as a whistleblower you've been protected right uh, it's it's the act is about that so i think yeah that's a good example in those lines all right so uh, is yeah. that all yes ma'am uh, okay. actually it was a wonderful lecture ma'am and uh, uh, we got uh, so much opportunity to discuss and uh, exchange yeah. our views during this session ma'am so ma'am thank you so much thank you so much for thank you ma'am uh, the questions of the participants as well. So, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Delighted to be here.